Welcome everybody, thank you for being there with us. This is Rafa and today I have the great pleasure of meeting a new friend. His name is Dale Branswald and we are going to be speaking a little bit about the, the great mind of Rudolf Steiner. Um, this is a, a character from the, uh, this is the 19th century, correct? And the 20th, you could say, yeah, 18, 1861 to 1925. Right. So this is a very interesting character from history. He's, uh, well, Dale's going to, to tell us a little bit more about him, uh, but Steiner, he's, he's this kind of very, very like uh, bird's eye view kind of mind for me. That's what, I, what I'm getting from him. And he Thanks. dives into as much into spirituality as he does into, into uh, like kind of like theology and even medicine and, uh, and history and world events and even forgotten ancient history. So he's a very interesting mind. But first, let me just say hello to my dear guest. Dale, how are you? Very good, sir. Great. I'm happy that you're here. Um, Dale, will you please let us know a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got into Steiner maybe, and, and yeah, and then we can just jump into whatever comes up. All right. So I... Uh... Uh, I guess let's just say that, that I ran into Steiner when I was uh, 22. So I'm 65 now. So that was 43 years ago. And, uh, and it was just in a class on Wittgenstein, believe it or not, that uh, a friend of mine was, uh, that I knew at the time was asking all these unusual questions. And I asked him where he was getting his ideas from. And he slid Steiner's book, The Philosophy of Freedom, across the table. And it just really did affect me from that moment on in my life. So uh, I guess then around 2005, after I'd recorded a lot of his books and had them on cassettes, I got permission from uh, steinerbooks.org, which by the way, is one of the two houses that translate Steiner and allow us to really uh, study him in English. Otherwise we'd have to know German. And they gave me permission to start a website. So since 2005, this is the beginning of the 18th year, I've been uh, recording his work and putting it up for free for people to think about these ideas that I think really would help the world a lot if we would all take them uh, on seriously. They don't have to be believed or anything, but just thought about in a serious way. So that's good enough for me. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, before we started recording, you were asking me about how I, I got into Steiner. Yes. And, and how, how recently, for me, it's not been as long. <laughs> um, it's been maybe like a year and a half or perhaps two years. It's kind of, the, the, I see a, a, us as a humanity, you know, in, this, in these recent years and these recent times, I see us like, it's, it seems like something has opened up for, for all of us. And for some of us, a little bit more, or, or in a very different, particular way. So for me, in, during this time, astrology started making sense to me. Uh, tarot also started making sense. It's like these things that they always kind of. Uh, I was always kind of curious about these ideas, but I kind of didn't understand them. You know, it's it's maybe probably right now I as I'm learning more and stuff. I see it's connected perhaps to the awakening of the, of the left brain, let's say, is it the left, the, or the, the right brain, sorry, the, like the feminine side of humanity, like our reconnection with our soul, how we've, we've forgotten so much about probably even more, but at, at least half of ourselves. And so I think this, this kind of awakening has been going on for humanity, and I know it has been going on for myself, and through so in this new like period of my life, I've been able to like before I would hear or read Steiner, and it didn't it didn't connect. You know, it, it was like very kind of I don't I don't know if abstract would be the word, but it's something that didn't resonate with me. But anyways, I would see his picture and I would uh, listen to to even your books, your readings of his books, and something would be like, mm, let's put a pin on this for for when when you're ready let's say that's how it felt so i just left it alone and then eventually i started hearing him uh hearing you actually read his stuff on on Ariman and which is something that i, I still kind of don't understand very much hello <laughs> uh, but this this idea of Ariman and like a, a kind of 
three, what's the, the word, like a, a kind of threefold thing with Ariman, uh, Christ and, and, and Satan. And it's kind of like something that I'm, I'm still like trying to understand or trying to, but yeah, that, that's kind of a little bit of a, a summary of, of how I, I got into him. And, and then I, I, during this recent period, I, I, I actually found uh, interesting that he, he, he also speaks of a sort of different a hypothesis perhaps of, of health, human health, which, which was very interesting for me and it resonates very much. And the other thing that I knew about him even before was the, the Waldorf schools, which I, I understood he had kind of come up with the idea or something like that, which was interesting. So yeah, th those are very different aspects or places from which I, I reached him. <laughs> Very nice, very nice description. So recently, and, and what, a, a few days ago, I had this idea of, of calling you and, and speaking with you about Steiner, because I was listening to this, this, uh, this talk of his or, or book called the, I have it right here, the, like, let me just get the name of the thing so I don't mess it up. It's called The Battles of the Fifth Post-Atlantean Period as Expressions of the Conflict Between Materialism and Spiritual Life. This was posted like nine days ago, but as you said, you've been recording this stuff for many years. Could you show me the picture of the book? I, it, yeah. it, it, the title is unusual to me. Uh -huh. I, don't hear, I, don't, I haven't heard it quite like that. Oh, I see. It's... Uh, so somebody has uh, uh, made up that title themselves, unless it's the title of a, of a lecture that I'm not aware of. But yeah, okay, it's certainly familiar, right? So the yeah, battles. It's, it's from <laughs> January 1917. Oh, very good. Everything he talks about is, it's from the karma of untruthfulness. Yep, what yep. Yeah. That's right, yep, yep. It's a very interesting uh, one. It's, it's maybe one of the first ones I've heard uh, of his, uh, like, on, on history, he's talking a lot about history and like the, the, the evolution of, of European politics and all that during, during, I guess he's talking about the war, he's talking about the First World War and how the, 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 the continent was kind of divided and how the, but also at the, at the start, he talks about more esoteric stuff like, uh, the, the, the elements, you know, the element of air, of earth and water and fire and, and how he connects all of this with the spirit and, and the, the invisible world acting upon the material world. I mean, that is just fascinating. It is. I mean, it, it made a, a big difference in my life. And I like how you said before that uh, there's sort of half the world missing. And you don't even realize it until you start listening to Steiner and realize he's kind of giving me a picture, at least, until I have the direct experiences myself of this other half of the world. And without, from what I can tell, any kind of uh, superstition, without any kind of asking me to believe in anything, but just like research. He's done the research, here are his findings, and he's sharing his findings. And whether you're going to agree or disagree or dismiss or not, that's completely up to you. And I love that freedom, really. It's very unique in that world, right? Of people telling us spiritual truths, right? And we're all, ooh, you know, it's nothing like that at all. And that was very liberating for me. Very grounding in a strange sort of yeah. A way. Yeah. It's fascinating that he, he has, <clears throat> he talks about this concept of spiritual science, which I, I've heard before mentioned in perhaps in, 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 the, in one of the translations of the Bhagavad Gita. You know wow. how uh, like Krishna is talking about how what he's revealing is the, is a science, and yeah, and, and when listening to, to him talk about it, and I I kind of understand where he he's probably coming from. Yeah. Yeah, we could say that science, right, has really done a wonderful thing in that it has uh, tempered. Uh, our our sense of knowing and tempered our sense of truth and falsehood and really grounded us through the sense world into really knowing that sense world. Whenever we were wrong, uh, the sense world was real quick to uh, teach us we were wrong. 
Uh, sadly, right now, we seem to be really, really wrong and we're not learning anything, but <laughs> hopefully we'll catch on. And uh, he says, Steiner says that this, uh, this transformation of our soul through the growth and development of science and now permeating all culture, really, whether we're taught science directly or not, right, is something that then allowed the, the clairvoyance of our time to reach deeper and farther into the spiritual world with greater accuracy and understand it in an actually an objective way, which was unusual in the past. He's saying most of the time it wasn't necessarily objective in the way it can be now, right? You were sort of overshadowed by higher beings who filled you with their presence and taught through that, right? And you, you spoke truth probably most of the time or all the time at that level of understanding. How much you yourself were even understanding what you said might right, be a question. But Steiner's saying he's only going to talk about what really he acquires and truly makes his own and understands out of his own human wide awake intelligence and share with us. And I, again, I sense that in how he communicates. Does that make any sense? And so therefore, he can call it a spiritual science, this kind of spiritual investigation he's doing. And ours says pretty much that you couldn't have done it before science was in the world as it is now. And I, I always found that kind of a beautiful synthesis and balance of, of what's come before with hopefully what will come in the future. Mm, that's a very interesting point. Um, how, if, I, if I'm understanding correct, you, you seem to say that he, he saw the, the science of today, perhaps aided by technology, which allows perhaps for, for clearer um, um, conclusions to, to be drawn from nature. Uh, it, it kind of allowed, it kind of paved the way for, for um, what maybe like a kind of more mature kind of spirituality today. Because I, I see that also with the other thing you said, how maybe in previous times, the spirit realm was more, more present in a way in people, even if they maybe weren't aware. Um, definitely the ego was, was a different creature back then that it is today and and this 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 bigger or, or yeah this this bigger presence of of spirit in in everyday life kind of was enough for for that period you know to to function perhaps uh i i, I i've been playing with this idea recently that that in the in the very ancient past who knows up, up to up to when but in the very ancient past uh, especially that that the world was more mystical or, or mythical than or it was both mythical and material like at the same time you know it's like people were more in connection with spirit and more in connection with this other half of, of himself and of the world Whereas for, for some reason today, it's been kind of diluted and we are more in, uh, in contact with that aspect just when, when we take like spe specific times for it uh, or, or when we perhaps connect with people who are more awake to that part and, and receive some information from them, like, I don't know, channelings or, or, yeah, or, or spiritual teachers. But it's like people were more in resonance with that. I guess it's something maybe similar to how animals live. Sure. So, so you're, yeah, yeah so you're sort of, theory. well, no, you didn't. That was very good. And doesn't it touch on one of Steiner's uh, main ideas? And that is that humanity. So, so one of the things I find fascinating in our time is we look out into the world and through all of archaeology and anthropology and paleontology, we have a fairly good feeling or pretty clear idea of how there's been an enormous amount of evolution on the earth, right? With various, you know, dinosaurs existing at one time and not anymore and everything else. So we're all, we're all in agreement that, yeah, there's been evolution in some fashion, but then you can say, well, and of course, right. There must've been an evolution of consciousness as well. And people go, what? No, no, no. Consciousness has always been exactly the same as it is now in the past. Right. I mean, you will find that if you, people look at you like, what do you mean consciousness has evolved? As Steiner says, right, that 
this has been a massive thing. The, the, the changes of consciousness, as you're talking about, uh, are, are sort of intuiting. He's saying very much so, but, right, the picture of it is very interesting. So as we go back into the past, the sense of our individual self becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. And more and more do we feel ourselves only as part of a community or a tribe or some kind of a milieu like that, right? And at the same time that that was happening, the spiritual world was just very much a part of our being. So much so that, you know, uh, well, as well, our memory was almost perfect. So there was no such a thing as writing mm. because there was no need for it. Everybody simply remembered through this communal life that they lived. Right. And, and we, we tend to, sorry that I cut you off, but we tend to, to project from our, from our, you know how sometimes we project onto animals and we, we think, oh, they must be sad, they must be this. But we also project into the past whatever our current zeitgeist and our current understandings today, we think, oh, so in the past, like you say, it must have been the same. So we think, ah, they didn't have writing, so they were more primitive. Exactly. Nicely said. Yeah. Or, or that uh, the pharaoh was a, a horrible despot who uh, was ruling over these people and oppressing them horribly. Steiner would say, you know, there could have been periods of that in the later times, but by and large, they were a like, like you said, like a hive or like a community of, of creatures that lived so intimately with each other that these notions that we bring from the present and shove into their faces are absurd, Ex except that we're so conceited in our understanding in our present day. We're so prideful that we now know stuff because look what science has given us. I mean, we have an incredible power over the nature around us. And we think, well, anything we think has got to be true, <laughs> right? And so we, and it's, called, it's actually called the fallacy of presentism. Presentism, to take what's the present and just throw it into the past and say everybody just thought the same. You see it in the movies nowadays, right? All this stuff from the past is these people are, sitting around John about social political ideas and you're like you know it, and you know from Steiner's point of view that was just it's just very inaccurate the other beautiful side of that is that when they had a religion or they had a culture in their time it was based on the modality of consciousness that they were living in together and so what manifests out of that is absolutely correct and true we look now and go oh look how they saw stuff right and in, in a thousand years, Steiner says, we'll be saying the same thing about you and I here and now. It will have its same so-called primitiveness, right? In that sense. And that was healing for me. That was a really wonderful experience to start to look at history now and imagine, okay, there were different forms of consciousness. Spiritual beings were involved right in front of their faces in a certain way after, for a time. But then he says it was right and good that 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 began to fade away because if you think about it how can an individual be free how can an individual be an individual if it's constantly filled with the presence of higher spiritual beings really there's no way you could be because you're just overwhelmed you're in awe you're in ecstasy with their presence so they had to move away they had to depart from us we had to be left alone and, and, and only use our sense perceptions, our physical sense organs to right, gather in this data and then think it through with that brain bound thinking that had to develop for that to happen. And out of all that, the ego, the sense of self became stronger and stronger and stronger. And through that separation from the Godhead, we are and have probably more so now become free beings. And the question is gonna be now, will we turn that freedom back to the Godhead, or will we not do that, right? Because if the, the idea is only through freedom can you have true love. Otherwise, it's the biological forms that we know animals exhibit, right? But can we really, really have freedom? Well, we can only, or excuse me, love. You can only have love if there's freedom first, right? I mean, it just makes sense when I thought about it anyway. If you're free, you can love. If, you, if you're not free, I mean, you're just doing biological stuff then, right? Taking care of your family, raising your kids. It's a form of love, but it's not the truly highest, purest spiritual love that we're capable of, I think. Okay, I'll stop there. I'm going on oh, too long. My... That's beautiful. You, can, you yeah. can take as long as you need because, <laughs> yeah, this, that's not what's so nice about these kind of conversations and this type of, of shows. And especially in this one, we like to just let, let our... Uh, let's, uh, uh, 
let loose our the, the reins of the of the horse and just yeah and just uh, uh, muse on yeah. stuff. Um, you know, you, you're making me think, making me remember of something else that I heard. I actually heard you reading again uh, from Steiner, which was beautiful when he talks about he because first of all, during his time, I want to try to understand a little bit better his time uh, when during, especially I think it's during the 1800s, so the, the first like half of his life, the, the idea of like theosophy and then uh, his own uh, anthroposophy and, and other like secret societies and groups of the sort. And even, I guess to a certain degree, society in general, but probably more the, the higher, the higher uh, perhaps more educated or, or more well-off people, they were aware of, of these ideas of Lemuria and Atlantis. It, it seems like from, from listening to and investigating stuff from, from that period of time, it seems like more people were, were speaking about these subjects kind of as a, a, common, a common thing. Uh, and, and it's only after some time that it that it has become kind of not taboo, but but kind of poo pooed, you know, like oh Atlantis, Lemuria, that's like myth written by Plato or whatever, and it didn't exist. That's uh, it's it's stupid to think that. But I think so. One that during that period people were more at least open to the possibility of those things being real and like uh, stuff that's coming back to 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 the to the focus, I think, like perhaps inner earth and all those kind of crazy things that, again, it's not that you have to believe them, but it's amazing to, to, to like include them in the, in the, in the salad, in your, in your brain and in your heart and just try to, to see how certain uh, pieces might fit and how they might work together, at least just to expand your, your consciousness and continue evolving. So people were more aware and more open to those things. And the thing that I heard you reading was connected to what you were just speaking, how during Lemurian and Atlantean times, the human mind was so different. So you mentioned kind of like perfect memory um, and, and, and other, other, other kinds of stuff, like different parts of the mind were more evolved uh, than they are today. And when I heard that, that was also very, very expansive for me and very freeing and liberating. To, to start imagining, oh wow, how how crazy that again we we project the present into the past, but to think that they were so different from us that maybe we were we would we would be unable to understand them if we had a Lemurian in front of us right now. I think that's probably really true, right? Yeah. Um, so you have you read? In Steiner, the basic kind of framework of what a human being is with his physical body and his etheric body and his astral body and his ego. Have you ever uh, read any of that stuff? Maybe yeah, a little. And, and a little bit. The, the correlations with astrology and the parts of the body, but, okay. but it's not something that I'm very, very clear on. So let's just start there maybe, and then we can sure. talk about some of these things from another point of view. So what I loved about his work, again, besides the one idea of the evolution of consciousness, is this other one of, well... Right now, in the materialistic age we live in, there's only the physical body with the physical senses. And okay, we'll talk about the mind, that there's a mind, obviously, through your behavior, I can be safe in my assumptions there. But he goes on to say, well, really, when we look out into nature, we see the mineral kingdom, we see the plant kingdom, and we see the animal kingdom. And he says, we're really profoundly related to each one of those. And I went, oh, wow, really? How could that be? What does that mean? He goes, well, let's look at the mineral kingdom. You have a mineral body, right? And without the mineral kingdom's foundation, you might say we wouldn't have one. So we really have an enormous gratitude to give to that kingdom of nature for providing us with this vehicle, this instrument that we can use. The ancestors, it, some call them. Say again? That say it some, again. Some uh, Indian tribes call the, the minerals and the rocks the ancestors, the grandfathers. Yeah, nice, like nice. Very yeah. good. So then, but then it's interesting because if you really carefully, scientifically look at your body, you realize that your body is actually decaying all the time. You're losing hundreds of thousands of cells. Substances are falling off your organism all the time. 
In fact, your body is continuously wanting to die. But something is there, right? Something is present that's constantly combating and fighting and replacing all the substances that your body is decaying away, right? That's not in the mineral realm. Clearly, you look in the mineral realm, that's not being provided by the mineral kingdom. But when we look at the plant kingdom, we go, oh, wow, the plant kingdom's doing that. It's replacing the cells, growth, reproduction, all these other fast, you know, aspects of the plant realm. And Steiner says, yes, there is indeed a set of cosmic forces penetrating the mineral kingdom, raising it up into a higher form of organization we call the plant realm. And we ourselves have an etheric body as well. And that etheric body is replacing all of the substances in our body all the time as well. It is also the seed of our memory. Our memory life lives in this etheric body, the human being, right? So our etheric body is very different from an, a plant's uh, etheric world, shall we call it there. And, but we get it from them, right? And our, the fundamentals of our thinking life even live in that etheric life. And there's many other things to talk about as Steiner's spiritual science investigates the etheric world. Then we look at the animal realm and we go, well, what's there? Well, there's a whole nother set of cosmic forces that are penetrating mineral plant and raising it to a being of sentience a being that has an inner life of experience, of pain, pleasure, and stuff that we can very easily experience by, you know, in, in, the, uh, we see in these animals. And we have that. We have passions, instincts, drives, all these things happening in us as well. We get that from the animal realm as well. So here we are united with the three kingdoms of nature in having three actual bodies that come from originally from their realms, right? Which is amazing to me. Why, why didn't I learn that in school? It's obvious once you think about it, which is another nice thing about Steiner's ideas is they tend to be obvious after you give them half a thought. Isn't that something? So then we're looking at us going, well, but yet I'm not an animal. I'm not trying to say I'm great or I'm this wonderful creature, but I'm clearly not an animal. That's very obvious. Animals in a way are like organically imprisoned in their senses. They, they, they have a sensation, they react to that sensation. They're very deeply into that stimulus response life. Whereas I don't have to be. I can stand way up beyond that and, and decide whether I even wanna starve myself to death on purpose. I mean, that's, that's amazing. An animal simply cannot do that, as far as I know, unless they're, you know, you could interpret some of their behaviors. So again, we stand upright in a vertical position, Steiner talks about the exceptions in the animal world. He says, that's part of something different in you. Uh, the fact that we have speech, that's part of you that's different from the animal realm. Uh, and there's a, many other things, but ultimately then there's a fourth member in us, right? Called the reincarnating individuality that is taking up these three bodies and living in them. So Rafi, so the idea of all this, Rafi, of all this is that then when we look back at the Atlantean times, Steiner says, well, if you were to see an Atlantean, you would see that their etheric body was way, way outside their physical body. Whereas in us, it's, it's just tightly knit right to the skin now. It's very much a part. And so part of their, the reason their consciousness was the way it was is because their bodies were still in a certain sense integrating into a certain relationship to each other. And in each of those successive epochs of civilization, you can look at the bodies and they help explain why consciousness was the way it was then. And it's so darn elegant. It blows your mind. You know, it's so, so they, their, their etheric body was so far out, right? That as Steiner says, they could grow plants. They could enter into the plant realm and they built their houses by manipulating plant life because their etheric body was still part of the etheric body of plants in that sense, right? Et cetera. And their memory life was so incredibly powerful that the idea of writing would have been utterly superfluous. Why would anybody waste their time scratching on a piece of paper? At the same time that there was no sense of self as you and I understand that. That's a weird one. You know what I mean? That let they me, really pop. Go ahead. Let me add something about the, the, the writing and the, and the plants, and then we can come back to this, this interesting part of the sense okay. of self. Um, so the etheric body, it's, it's something, you know, there's different, uh, like, um, different groupings or descriptions of the different bodies of humanity, of, of humans in the different... Uh, Vedic system, Buddhist, uh -huh. etc. And this one, the etheric, has always been kind of like a 
I, I haven't ever been kind of able to like trace a line. I'm more from the from the Eastern mysticism side of okay. things, so or, or Eastern spirituality. So very good. Uh, kind of my thing is from there. So the Western thing, I'm trying to to include it more in my being because of my 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 heritage and whatever. I I, I think it's it's awesome to to learn that part too. Uh, and so the etheric body, I, I love how you're you're connecting it to the plants. I never would have made that ah. connection, and, and it's amazing. And so they. They they had this 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 is like a, it's science fiction for us today, you know, to think of a, a, a race of people that could grow plants by by will. <laughs> and um, what was the other thing that, that that I told you I wanted to to say something about um, the etheric the, body's nation, relationship in terms of Eastern wisdom and struggling with it. Well, yeah, I, I kind of, I lost my train of thought. But okay, we'll okay. see if it comes back. Yeah, Let's get back to, uh, to uh, the sense of set. Yeah. Well, I always want to go back to that because, again, we don't want that presentism to think that these guys were doing this or gals or whatever they were, right? We're doing this in some, I remember, in some yeah. way that was, okay, go. So, yeah. So the other thing was the writing thing. That, uh, again, uh, when you were speaking, this thing came to me of like, uh, when they started to write, it was more kind of out of a sense of desperation. It's like, oh, we're forgetting everything. We need to put it down more than, oh, we are so smart. We're going to put it down in, in writing, right? right? Exactly. Uh, That's how, and that just blew my mind. It was so elegant. It's so, well, of course, because, you know, we have this thing. They must have been stupid in the past, and we're finally smart now. <laughs> and all, all Steiner would say is no wisdom had a, a face a different face all the time but it was always wisdom it, in fact it kind of was always science if you wanted to say how did the people react to the direct knowing that was right in front of their faces well they did it you might say uh, in a scientific way but they had organ okay here's the other thing all these bodies Rafa is it Rafa or Rafi yes Rafa Rafa, it's Rafa, Rafa. like the archangel oh yeah very good Rafa <laughs> is that all these bodies we have all have organs of perception in them, which is amazing. Now, the only ones we use are the ones in our physical body and we get data from those. And then our ego, our ego has an organ of perception that we use all the time. Do you, do you, do you, have you ever thought of what that is? The, the ego, what is the organ of perception that the ego has? I understand the ego, the ego using identification. So I'll just say this, thinking, yeah. thinking, thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. thinking is literally the organ of perception of the ego, which is really kind of beautiful, right? It's half physical, half spiritual already. It's that yeah. threshold place, right? So, but the astral body has organs of perception as the Buddha talks about. So you have the lotus flowers and, and if you get your lotus flowers spinning, you will actually receive uh, literally data, you might say, from the astral world. And then also the etheric world has organs of perception. So initiates, all the initiates of the past have been able through meditation, through concentration, through exercises that uh, brought control and order and power to their consciousness, were able to access the information that comes to those organs from the etheric world, from the astral world, from the world of thinking, and from the physical world, and uh, integrate them into an understanding that they could share with us through history, right? And uh, in a way, the initiates of the past were always the ones that were closer to us than the average people were in their times. They were more egoed beings than the people they were have and you could even say that of steiner steiner was in a certain sense more of a self <laughs> than you or i are I mean, really if you think about it his selfhood was so magnificent that his learning could i mean the learning curve that guy had <laughs> is pretty pretty amazing i mean it goes like that you know what i mean and so so even then we we're seeing a self that's going to be a future self of all humanity in a 500 years or a thousand years and he wanted to show as much of that sense of self he had to bring us into awe bring us into yes i see this is valuable for in a practical way not just for some you know oh, i want to be an amazing guy no i can serve my fellow human being better i can i can be a greater human being in relation to my other human beings in terms of service and sacrifice and helpfulness and that really is the core of anthroposophy it isn't about becoming some amazing guruish energy right unless it's to share and help others 
without that, really, you're almost talking about black magic in a certain sense. You know what I mean? And which is interesting, right? Because in a, in a way, in the West, especially, we're so egocentric that the minute we start to imagine, oh, I can have powers and abilities through uh, meditation and these things, and I'll just be an amazing dude, man. Is this, that's, that's a scary motivation for trying to become, uh, to grow spiritually, right? That's where we get into the Lucifer and Araman aspects that are, we're always battling against. How do we not fall into the temptations in one direction or the other, right? Oh, very good. Go Thank you for correcting me. I said Satan earlier. Oh yeah, right, right. The, the yeah. That yeah, actually, Araman is Satan. That in the Bible, right. the word Satan and Araman, Steiner says, are the are the same person. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I have a hard time with that uh, Trinity. That would be uh, with that Trinity of of uh, Araman, Lucifer, and, and Christ, because I I have specifically like yeah, how to differentiate Araman and Lucifer. It, it can be tricky. Sure. Well, we, we could give a loosey goosey thing, but it gets very subtle in the, in like subtle realms of cognition and stuff, but uh, sure. So, you know, first of all, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that historically. So in the, when did the human being begin reincarnation? When did we actually start to become creatures that physically embodied in order to spiritually develop now that, and that happened in the middle of the Lemurian epoch. Before then, we did not do that. We were more like incorporating into matter like plants did. I guess because we didn't have the, the what you call the reincarnating individual, the, the astral body, I guess. Well, the, the ego. So it was the ego, the spirits of form or the exousiae or the Elohim, as they're talk, talked about in the Bible. There were finally the conditions available on the earth for the, the beginning of the incorporation of the ego. And that happened when the densest, deadest substances of the earth were pulled out of it. That, and those two things happened almost at the same time. So when the densest, hardest substances of the earth were pulled out of it and became the moon outside the earth orbiting it, it created a wonderful balance with the sun and the moon and the earth that allow, that I guess you could say these beings, ah, it's time. Now we can begin this, this next stage of the evolutionary process of the human being, and it can embody itself in matter, okay? And when it started to do that, the minute it could do that, the minute we were starting to become present on the planet, this is always happening in history, by the way, a door is open for the influence of spiritual beings that wasn't there before. And in this case, luciferic beings saw this astro, this ego entering into the astral world and they kind of dived in and took hold of the ego in a way that brought the, and I'm, I'm struggling to say this, okay? So I'm doing my best. Nobody quote me verbatim here that caused the ego to be a little too interested in the sensuous aspects of the astral experience. It, a little too much in love with what matter was doing to it than it should have been. And this caused the fall to become very intense and the separation from the Godhead to be more than maybe it should have. Now, this is very difficult to say because Steiner then says, Steiner then says, but that separation re resulted in something that created such hindrances that our evolution can become greater because of them. So it's a real difficult thing to black and white it. OK, and I'm, I'm kind of doing the black and white picture just to, just for the sake of contrast. Yeah, we need to, to yeah. in order to explain it, we, we are we are forced to, to project our, our present way of thinking onto onto that as well I mean, as, as come, kind yeah. of to make a metaphor that can connect. Yeah. Now, you know, there's this this group that they they channel. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, uh, the law of one. I've heard of it maybe, but no, I don't know and, anything and they, about they it. They talk about this. And also the other thing you, you made me think of is the, the book of Urantia, which kind of talks about the, I guess it's the, the Luciferian part, uh, uh, getting into, into, into the planet. And in the law of one, they, they say that, yeah, these, <laughs> these ideas are like so, so, uh, so floaty floaty that you know you start trying to to bring them down try to anchor them into, into words and and they they dissipate so fast um but yeah the, the, just the things that came to to mind was this these uh, the law of one people I, i'm 
the idea is going to come back, but please go, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I see. I see. So, so ultimately then Steiner says as civilization and culture grew, really at that early time, it was the gift of Lucifer's forces because it brought a freedom. And in that freedom, we created. And in that freedom, we, you know, we did what we did. So there's this whole cultural reality where the forces of Lucifer were in a way, even though they separated us from the Godhead too much, were at the same time beneficial. It's so complicated. Yeah, you, you could even think it's just part, natural part of the process. Because exactly. If, yes. if that is what happened and, and you can see something positive coming from it, then yeah, it's just part of the process. Right. But we project the, the white and black thing and, and we say, ah, if it has some darkness, then it's absolutely evil. But right. no, it, it, life requires death and death requires life. And yeah. There you go. Yeah. And so this, th that occurred for a time and, uh, you know, in many veils, in many uh, ways. Um, and the human being's ego sense gradually became stronger through many, many countless thousands of years, right? Countless millennia, uh, this, this occurred. And Steiner then discusses this in, for instance, an outline of esoteric science or an outline of occult science, one of his basic books. He gives kind of a picture of this. It's really good. So then we got to a point where, uh, where how could we say this? Where the, we even forgot, we really kind of forgot even those influences. The, the, the physical world became so real to us mm. that we didn't even think thinking was spiritual anymore. I mean, we think that now. We don't even think the life of our, spirit, of our thinking has a spiritual quality to it. It's just a bunch of stuff our brain excretes, you know, like our liver, like our your gallbladder does bile or something, you know. It excretes thoughts in this kind of comical way we yeah, understand. The brain that. creates consciousness. It's the... Yeah, the, you're right. The, the this is thinking. right. And that is because then after we got to a certain place in evolution, we were opened up again in such a way that another form of spiritual being could find ingress, could find a way in and influence our soul. Right. And it was always there. And, and, and so I'm they sort of would take turns. But when that really kicked in in high gear was during the Renaissance, 1413, when we were so incarnated in matter and so closed off from the spiritual world that Araman's forces could really take hold of our consciousness. And man, we penetrated into matter after that at an incredible speed. If you think about what we've done in 800 years since then compared to hundreds of thousands of years in the past, which is why we think we're so smart, right? It's because the Araman's forces could really see, and really all you are now is just a lump of flesh, right? That excretes things, right? There's nothing spiritual at all. That's the dumbest idea you could ever have, right? And uh, we now know better, right? We know better now, okay? And that's the triumph of Araman in our lives. So you're either on the one hand, absolutely material and all of spirituality's illusion in our time, or on the other side, you really are so kind of ecstatic and kind of... Uh, in awe of consciousness in such a way that you don't think the physical world is really real, which has got this Maya aspect from the East, right? The East is, you might say, still very much a Luciferic form. The hardcore technology of America is probably the epitome of Araman. And somewhere we need to find that middle because both of those things are just going to be there, whether you want to get rid of them or not, right? And so we have that, that Lucifer thing shows up in, you know, in things like channeling and mediumism is where we want to just let the cosmos come in and not even be a part of it, not even let the ego be aware of what's happening in us. And Steiner said that was appropriate even in a certain time in history. But in our time, it is a very, very dangerous thing that the wide awake ego has to be present in all spiritual experience. That's very different from the East, maybe. I don't know. It depends. There's so many different. To say the East is way too general, right? Because you got, even in Buddhism, you've got 1,000 schools. So, you know, there's no way to know. But, but in, in this, we know from science, you can't do science without a wide awake, sharp, ego -cent centered being. Really, in fact, you know, I mean, that's a very good example of what an ego does it solves problems. The minute you have to solve a problem, all your ego forces come to a point of focus and begin trying to solve the problem, right? And it may bring in imaginations and intuitions, but the ego's in control, right? And Sider says that's how our spiritual development in our time must needs happen 
in a moral sense. To be truly moral, our moral agency is the self. Whether it's evil or good, it's a moral agency, right? And I, I was very, uh, I, I responded to that very strongly too, because I was kind of floating in, ooh, yeah, let's go, you know, let's be all mystical kind of thing. And do all, Steiner's not a mystic. Steiner's not mystical at all. But you would go, well, what? What are you talking about? Look at all the stuff he talked about, right? But he did it as a scientist of the spirit. Isn't that interesting? So it's so different in that way. I'll be quiet. Go ahead. Yeah. Everything, everything you're saying is fantastic. I'm thinking now, um, in connection to the to the law of one channelings, they talk about uh, like through different periods of time, we are let's say like entering different densities is what they call it. Okay. And right now we're moving into. I always get it confused if it's fourth or fifth density, and. They connected with the chakras, so I guess it would be fifth density. We are getting into the the, the green brain, or or whatever it's called, and and through those periods, for example, what's similar is that first density is the mineral realm, second density is the the vegetable realm, third density is animals, fourth density is where we are now, and there there is something very interesting, how uh, some animals like pets, for example they are considered in kind of like 3.5 or something like that because they are kind of, thanks to their interaction with us, they are kind of evolving into the, the next density for them. And, you know, sometimes I, I watch it on social media, these videos of cats and stuff like that because it's just so fun. But the other day, there was this cat that actually talked. <laughs> you could hear him say, like, uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but he was Basically speaking, it was incredible. <laughs> incredible, yeah. And so then this this fifth density we're entering in, uh, for them, it's, it's this place where where a kind of not, not not exactly a hive mind, but a more like kind of telepathic kind of sense of of connectedness between between all humans would, would start developing in, in this next period. And I'm guessing it it may have some some uh, some more commonalities with with Steiner's with Steiner's ideas. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it does in that sense. Um, so yeah, so we have this gradual uh, descent into matter, right, uh, stage by stage, and. He has uh, words that he uses for that. And I don't remember the terminology so well, but right at the at the at the bottom of that, at the bottom of the descent, the Earth itself was about middle aged and was going into its old age, and humanity had kind of spent all its forces, right? So that there had to be some response from the spiritual world that brought us new that brought us forces to now continue to ascend. To actually our so that our fifth density is actually going to be <laughs> less dense than our fourth one. So there, the terminology for me, I would be working with that we're going to start to undensify, as it were, you know, as we ascend back into the spiritual world, but with this ego that we've created, right? This ego that we have created really brings us into the spiritual world, as Steiner said, calls us the 10th hierarchy. We haven't talked about the nine hierarchies that he talks about quite a bit, right? The angels, the archangels, you've heard of these before, right? The archai, the exousiae, the dunamis, the curiotites, the thrones, the cherubim, and the seraphim, right? These are the nine hierarchies of beings, very, very busily active in our world. You could say this, Steiner says in a place, he says that in a certain sense, the development of humanity, the growth of humanity on the earth is the religion of the gods. We are their religion. They're, you know, kind of, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, right? We're this, we're this pregnancy that they're trying to bring into realization. But we're unique in the sense that we've been separated off from the Godhead in a way that it doesn't seem any of the hierarchies during their human stages, because they all went through human stages like we are, but in a completely different environment, right? Well, probably during that period where there was no reincarnation. When there was no what? Reincarnation. Recognition? No, reincarnation. Sure. Oh, the, well, no matter. There was no physical matter okay. either, in a way, right? We could go through, we could go a little bit into that, but it might be too tiresome. But the Saturn evolution, the Sun evolution, and the Moon evolution—you remember those? No, I don't know 
Oh, okay. So that again is the book, An Outline of Esoteric Science. If you want to study a good overview, you mentioned his bird's eye view before, and that's on the on the web. I have that on there. Uh, but he talks about, uh, you know, when these beings, at least the angels and the archangels and the archai went through their human stages and what they're doing now in our soul life in a sense. But but all these beings are still active, as you mentioned before, in uh, in, in, the, our, in our world, which is Steiner describes. I, okay, so, so the point being is that this descent, the forces that were then brought to us from the spiritual world came through uh, the Christ being incarnating in Jesus of Nazareth. Have you studied that story much at all? Uh, from Steiner's point of view? Yeah, from no. Steiner's point. Okay, okay, let's see how wild this is for you. This is pretty wild. We could do yeah, this. What I the heck? It. Let's blow people's minds. Why not? Uh, so Steiner, first of all, discovered all this stuff through his direct spiritual experience. Then he went to the Bible and went, oh, that's how they say that here. It would be like you and I inventing geometry and, mm -hmm. and creating all of geometry, right? And then finding a book of Euclid and going, oh, be darned. Somebody did this back 2000 years ago. Look, there's that theorem we invented, right? So that's Steiner in terms of this. Okay. So so here's the thing. Steiner says that for a, a being that was of such a high degree as the Christ being, was a very, very high spiritual being, for it to try to incarnate into the corrupt uh, uh, human form, which has gone through reincarnations and gathered all this karma up. You know what I'm saying? This thing was really corrupted. That if the Christ tried to incarnate into it, it would have destroyed it almost immediately would have turned it into dust almost immediately. So the higher worlds realized that they had to prepare a body in which the Christ could live for, and in this case, for about three years anyway. It wouldn't have lived any longer in it than that anyway, even if it had stayed alive, which is fascinating. But to do that, now that we have Steiner's picture, we realize, number one, a physical body has to be created that's suitable. Number two, an etheric body has to be there that's not corrupted by karma. And number three, an astral body has to be purified enough so that these three bodies are ready for the entry of the Christ. Isn't that wild? So he said they he, he says that the Hebrew people were set aside by the higher worlds at a certain time in their evolution and were formed and structured in their culture in order to then, through the course of many generations, create a body that would be able to be ready for the Christ. That's and that was I their yeah, you know what? Um, Go ahead. I, I've been doing Akashic Records readings, and in, in one uh, with, with, a, with a client, there, there came this, this very clear picture about she being, about her being a, a dancer or like a, a kind of priestess that would use dance as her as part of her rituals or, or something like that. Uh -huh. And, and th this was like in a place kind of, kind of like felt kind of like Egypt or something. Well, I'm not sure. It felt kind of like, ah. like, a, like a desert or, or some of lot, lots of sand. And they, they, there was this group of, of female dancers doing some kind of ritualistic dance and, and spinning around or something like that, which was generating a kind of vortex uh, in, in the center, um, an, an etheric vortex, right? Or, or astral, I don't know the exact term. Okay. Um, and that this was connected to the birth of Christ in that this dance they were doing was one small part of a giant ritual that had been, taken play, had been taking place for many, many years. Many, many... Yeah, I didn't get an exact number, but this sensation of this is like instead of a ritual that you like sit down for half an hour and you do it this was like many many years having taken place in the past and coming up up until that point and probably would would be something that would continue until the birth and that this kind of ritual was like you were just spent saying it was something that was helping prepare energetically the the world and etc for the incarnation of of christ that's an amazing story. Yeah. <laughs> that really is. That really is something. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, it, that's it. You, that's what you were going to share. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love the picture of that. So yeah, we can see then the whole Hebrew culture in a certain sense being that community, doing that aspect, preparing the physical body. Now the, the other the other aspect then is well, what about the etheric body? What what could anybody do? What could you and I ever do? that would purify an etheric body. Nothing, really. There is nothing we could do. So, so Steiner describes then that there was a time when uh, just before and after the moon was separated from the earth, when it was harder and harder for human beings to find incarnation because matter, every time we would take up matter, we would so densify it that that matter could never be used again for us, not, not reincarnating, mind you, but just to be to taken up in, let's say, this plant-like way that we would take up matter, right? When the earth was very different in what's called the moon evolution. You just study that in an esoteric science book. And so over time, we calcified the earth through our uh, need to engage matter for our evolution. We were calcifying it to the point where we couldn't uh, uh, get on it anymore. And that's when the higher worlds then took this hardened matter, you might say, that we created and made the moon out of it. <laughs> Pretty wild, right? But right, at, but there was one person or being who was kind of able still to take hold of that. And that was this being we call the Adam soul. And so this Adam soul was like the last human entity, if the, we were even individuated enough to call ourselves that, that could take up that matter almost, let's say, at the same time that the moon forces, uh, the moon was separated. And this being's etheric forces were so powerful that part of his etheric body was kept back in the spiritual world and never found incarnation. And Steiner says, so this was kind of carried by the higher beings as humanity started to reincarnate, reincarnate, reincarnate. And... Uh, damaged, you might say, its etheric forces from all the karma that it had to take on, right? Even though we were evolving. And so there was this etheric body then that was also going to be part of the story of Christ's being born. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of painting the pictures of these bodies, right? The third body was trying to find an astral body that would be pure enough. And that astral body ended up being created in human history by Buddha. Okay, the Buddha purified his astral body. This Nirmanakaya being then was ready. And during the time of uh, the, the children, there are actually two Jesus children. One of them is described in the Matthew gospel. He's born in a house. And the Magi, who are Zarathustrian priest kings from Zarathustra's time, come to this child. And the other child is born in a manger. And different beings, shepherds come to him. And so the Bible in a secret way actually tells the story of these two children that had to be born, one with a physical body that was from the Hebrew people that would be ready to, uh, to take on, right, to, to, be, uh, to be able to hold the Christ's presence in it. And Well, that's a little complicated, but, but, but the point being is then this etheric body was born in the Luke child. So the, the, the book in the Gospel of Luke is describing this very special Jesus child. They were main, named Jesus. Their parents were named Mary and Joseph, just like we have cultures and villages of the world where everybody's named the same now. We still have that now in some cultures, right? Where all, you know, almost all the women are named the same. Almost all the men are named the same. So there was nothing that strange about that, even though people will kind of poo-poo that in a way, right? But you had... You had this ch one child was born, and it was the reincarnation of Zarathustra. And that's the child described in the Matthew Gospel. And it grew up. It was incredibly wise. People were amazed by it. Uh, you know, it grew up in a house. It was a different culture. Father was, I think, a priest in the, in the temples. And the other Jesus child was very simple. He had this pure etheric body, and he had the Nirmanakaya over his astral body before it was born, you might say. We haven't talked about that. So that there was a very pure being, but it was very simple. He just sort of radiated love and he was simple and people adored him, but he wasn't wise in the sense of the, and that's the Luke Jesus as opposed to the Matthew Jesus. So then this special moment happens, which is talked about in the, in the, in the scene at the temple. And there's this thing in the Bible where it says that all of a sudden the parents left, they didn't know where their kid was. They came back and their child is teaching in the temple as though he's one of the wise. And Steiner says, this is an esoteric picture, 
a hidden picture of the fact that the Matthew child's ego, the Zarathustra ego, had transmigrated into this pure body of the Luke child and taken it up because it really almost didn't even have an ego. It just had a pure, untouched, etheric body from the first Adam. And it had this pure astral body protected by the Nirmanakaya Buddha, which right at that time of the 12th year, which was puberty in those days, the Nirmanakaya left. And Steiner says that it took these forces from this Luke child and it was a rejuvenation of Buddhism. All of Buddhism was affected by that. And it's interesting that 100 years later, we get Mahayanic Buddhism, which is very, very different from the early Buddhism. Because then the Bodhisattva said, no, I'm not going to just take off and never come back. Right? The Buddha said, you want to take off and never come back, man? <laughs> and he went, no, I'm not. I'm going to go back until even every blade of grass is liberated. That's a very different orientation in Buddhism. And what could argue it comes from the Christ? A little, a little bit too assumptive there. I may be presuming too much. No, so anyway, what we, yeah, yeah. it is an interesting picture. And Steiner talks about that. So then we now have, finally from 12 to 30 years old, we have this being that has the ego of Zarathustra and this incredibly unique body. And because Zarathustra was the highest, most ancient initiate that had ever existed on the earth, and it, it had grown through you know many, many incarnations to become incredibly wise, he was able to then bring this wisdom into the astral body and into the etheric body of his him, himself, I guess you could say, right? Because he'd moved into this body and, and taken it over and lived in it then. Uh, and so Steiner talks about this. There's a set of lectures called the fifth gospel, where he then talks about the struggles from 12 to 30. What happened during those years from 12 to 30? Why did uh, Zarathustra, let's call him, he was Jesus of Nazareth at that time, right? Why would he have felt any need to do what he did, which was what? Well, let's go, now, now we go to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, what was the baptism? Well, from a clairvoyance point of view, when John the Baptist would do a baptism, because he was a clairvoyant, he would put the person under water and he would watch their bodies. And when a person's, a and when, is, when a person's gets the feeling they're going to die in a horrible way, right? Their, their uh, etheric body will loosen from their physical organism. Normally, your etheric body and my etheric body are tenaciously tied to the physical body, constantly changing out those substances, right? All the time, because your body's dying all the time. So this etheric body, so there's no way for us to have any experience of what's really contained in our etheric body, which is something pretty amazing. OK, so and what it is, is every single moment of your life and my life is perfectly recorded in our etheric body in full 3D virtual reality, to use some of the ugly terms of our modern age. Right. And so he would see this happen. He would see the etheric body separate violently and he would pull them out of the water. And what had happened was, is their life had passed before their eyes. And they repented, man, <laughs> in those days. And he says, and Steiner says very carefully he says we cannot do that in our age because those bodies are tied together far differently than they were two or three thousand years ago yeah right? people were so, born again definitely at that moment. In, in a different way so that was baptism that's what that's what the wow. baptism of john the baptist was i go oh oh i see and that was a very but again because we have these four bodies to talk about we can have a picture we can even kind of explain this mm -hmm. in a way that's not so crazy right in a certain sense so what happens is that through these experiences that Steiner describes in his fifth gospel lectures given in 19, I believe, 13, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Zarathustra, realized that humanity could not continue, that humanity wasn't going to be able to continue with the forces that he said, for instance, when we would do the rituals of every religion he could find that he discovered as he did his travels, that those, that those rituals in that time, because of our degradation of our bodies, those rituals which were supposed to bring in the higher spiritual beings to bless us brought in demons. And we were actually inviting demonic forces more and more into our being because we, were, we didn't have those forces anymore. And he saw this over and over again in all these different ways. And even the people like the Essenes who were able to keep the, the demonic beings at bay could only do it by uh, separating themselves off from all of society. So they were no help to the evolution of the earth either in that sense, right? Because the only way they could do that was to shove everything away and go, we're going to develop out of our own private selves 
And, you know, it probably had a destiny that was important for us, but he saw, no, that can't be the path either. So through these struggles, then he must have had some kind of awareness of the presence of the Christ ready to enter him. So he was such a high initiate that the ego, Zarathustra, could voluntarily separate and give up his physical body, his etheric body, and his astral body so that the Christ could embody himself in those bodies, take up all the experiences that were in them, because he'd never been in a physical human body before. He didn't know anything about humanity in the, in the inner sense, right? And the, all the memory life that lives in the etheric body and all the, the life that lives in the physical body. And he had to go into the wilderness, right, for 40 days to begin to incorporate himself into this organism. And that's esoterically shown in the Bible, if we can read those stories correctly. Steiner says they're literal, but you and I don't have the mind to understand their literalness until we attain to a clairvoyance and can see, oh, that's what that's really telling us, okay? So then what happens, Rafa, is that Steiner uh, describes just amazingly how the Christ then goes through three Easter's. There are three Easter's in the Bible that are describing the complete transformation of our astral body to the end of human evolution, where it becomes what's called the eternal spirit self member of our organism. And then the place where he completely transforms our etheric body all the way to the end of human evolution and becomes an eternal part of our organism called life spirit. And finally, at the Easter that you and I understand or have read about, he transforms even the physical body to the end of human evolution. And it becomes the resurrection body. That's an eternal part of our organism that we'll all eventually have hundreds of millennia or billions of millennia in the future, right? And so, and where are these? Well, the one, the astral body being completely transformed into the spirit self was the vision of the, of the disciples seeing Jesus walk on the water. When they saw that, Steiner says, that's really a description of the moment when the Christ had completely transformed the astral body into the spirit self. When Jesus is standing on Mount Tabor and he's clothed in this luminous white, that's when the etheric body was completely transformed by the Christ. And then, as we know, the resurrection body, when Mary met the resurrection body at the, at the, at the tomb, a woman, by the way, did that first, right, uh, met those. And so what happened then is all these parts of us that are part of us, but are still in germinal stages, we're all given new forces by the Christ. It has nothing to do with belief. It has nothing to do with believing in Jesus or Christ or all these cockamamie ways that religion wants to control us. It has to do with understanding the nature of the Christ being. So there, there are people, we'll go into that maybe some other time, but there's a, there's a Christian community that Steiner helped start, that people asked him to start. He didn't found it because he that wasn't his path. But a bunch of people said, could you help us with ritual? We think ritual should be still done in the modern world, but the Catholics are still using a ritual from the older forms of consciousness. So it's inappropriate. It's nothing negative about it. They just don't understand that consciousness has evolved and they haven't, okay? Protestantism, again, doesn't understand the nature of consciousness. So I said, I'll help you. So he gave them about 100 lectures <laughs> and, and, and rephrased all the liturgies and the Christian community, the movement for religious renewal has the seven sacraments and it's all over the world. OK, there's churches all over the world. It created a new priesthood in 1922, which has men and women ordained as full priests, the first church in world history that ever did that before anybody else had women and men married, etc. But they're a new priesthood, OK, etc., etc. The reason I mentioned that. What was the name of them again? It's called the Christian Community. Hardly much of a name, mm -hmm. right? The Christian Community Movement for Religious Renewal. And it was started on September 16th, 1922, I believe is the, is the inauguration of it. And I've gone to that church for 30 years. We have a church here in Denver. And uh, you know, it's, it's built by an anthroposophical architect. So it's a really cool building. And there's many of those all around the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's fascinating, but you know, it's its own thing. It's, it's something to, to experience. I, I go there really because I get to hear Steiner in, in the liturgy, he reformed the liturgy, right? And so it's, uh, I get to kind of hear, in a way I sometimes think it's how he really talked all the time in his inner life, <laughs> not to other people, right? Hey, so, I, 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 so I lost my, my, okay, so we were talking about 
this ascent, believe it or not, I'm still on the same subject. So this descent. So after all this has happened now, we are ascending mm -hmm. and the Christ forces are working in us help, but we have to meet them right with the ego that we now have in freedom. It's our responsibility to understand, but not in belief, but in understanding. This is important to turn and try to engage those forces because they're present. We have no excuse now. We had, you might say, an excuse. we didn't have the forces necessary to rise any further, any farther. And now they're there. Will we take them on is a question for human destiny. You know, will we love? You know, will we really love? That's the question, I think, for all of us, right? If we don't, I don't think it matters how spiritually developed we get. In fact, we'll probably go into the darkness farther. In a, in a strange sort of a way, right? Will we really love? Pregnant, pregnant question, yeah? yeah. Uh, I'm talking, okay, go ahead. I tend to be a very kind of naive, optimistic in, in, a, in a way, like I feel like it's all, all sort of pre, it's not pre-planned, but, but the, the odds are, are extremely in our favor. Um, just like you were saying earlier during the beginning of the conversation, how certain uh, certain perhaps negative forces came in but they actually kind of helped in the evolution of consciousness absolutely and, and right now I, I started remembering this idea from the law of one which which they kind of say that something that happened here was uh, what they called the veil of forgetting and this thing what it did it it separated the conscious mind from the from the subconscious mind and ah. we, we it's, it's when we started to and I don't really know how to explain it, but we started to to forget who we really are uh, and what might seem like kind of like a punishment or a curse it's actually that before this beings had access to their subconscious mind and evolution was very slow because there was no reason to to evolve there they were just in in kind of this this god realm, this devic realm of, of like absolute pleasure, absolute knowledge. So there was no need for for growth. But when this was included, the veil of separation of, of forgetting, when this was included, the, the 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 impulse for evolution became a lot greater. So through through this kind of um, I, I I wrote down some notes to remember the idea. So. From this kind of evolution through limitation, uh, actually the, the, the evolution in consciousness was assisted and, and helped to, to, to explode in a way. And I think this, for, on the first, uh, on, on the one hand, this conversation is like, <laughs> I, I'm an Aquarius, so I love all of this. I'm like <laughs> dancing in. In the, in the clouds with, with this conversation, I'm, I'm just loving it. And at the same time, I know uh, it's, it's a lot. Uh, Steiner was a lot. Like you were just saying, oh, can you help us? And he gave a hundred lectures. <laughs> it's like sometimes you, one might, might be like, oh wait, I, I wanna do this one thing. I don't even know where to start. And this guy did a hundred just as a favor to some friends. Um, so what I would like to do right now is to take a, a short break, yeah? And okay. we can come back for the second half. Uh, okay. I'm gonna invite people to, to check out your, your YouTube channel if they're interested in, in learning more about Steiner's ideas. Um, I wanna... Mention okay. also that the main site is uh, rudolfsteineraudio.com, which is not a YouTube site. So there's a lot of my, my stuff has kind of migrated all over the web. And the main site that still has everything on it is rudolfsteineraudio.com. That's my main site where I put stuff on. And then when I post it, some of it goes to a YouTube channel. Some of it goes to Podbean. It's called the Podbean streaming site. And then there's also Rudolf Steiner Press, which has taken on uh, uh, using it for their uh, YouTube channel as well. And there's even a bunch of other ones. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm not complaining. But just so you know that that's the home site, really, RudolfSteinerAudio.com, if you would be so kind. Yeah, so, so am I supposed to separate off here and go get a drink or something? Or, or, or just, am I still yeah, yeah. on? Am no, I still we, on? We, we're still on, yeah. In, in, okay, let, okay. Let me just, just close up. So thank you okay. for sharing those, those links. Uh, people people will, will, will get your, your, your pointing that you just gave. And also, I, I would like to... Uh, to 
to let you guys know the, the links are going to be on the description of the video below uh, for, for easier access. Um, and also I want to invite people to my Patreon. Uh, it's a, a community that I, I'm trying to, to get uh, to, to expand and to get larger. And I'm sharing uh, exclusive episodes there. I'm also sharing some healing. And eventually when there's more people in it, I would love to, to create more like uh, Akashic Records reading for, for like group Akashic Records readings and, and start to, to find to, to, to explore more of, of what we're doing here and, and learning, uh, getting, getting some guidance perhaps from, from the, these higher realms, like you're saying, we, we need to, to, to be more, um, more responsible in, in these days when, okay, many of us already, we know there's this spiritual half and this, um, the spiritual side of us that, that we've uh, missed, uh, well, we, we, we've forgotten, we've, we've misplaced maybe, and, and we're learning to, to, to get back in, con, in, in communion with that, which is, I think, the, the, the greatest uh, service that we can do for ourselves and for all of humanity uh, in these days. So yeah, again, the links will be all down there in the, in the description below. We'll take a, a, short, uh, a short body break, as they call it, and we'll be right back. Okay, so thank you everybody, and also the link for the, for the Patreon will be there, so you can uh, get access to, to this second hour. So thank you, uh, Dale, we'll be seeing each other in just a minute, okay? Okay. And thank you everybody for being there, bye-bye.